Hi, everybody, and welcome to Leadership Labs, an online experience for marketplace leaders. Our special guest today is my good friend, Clay Scroggins. Clay and I worked together for 20 years at several of our Atlanta area locations. Clay has authored three books on the topic of leadership. His most recent book is entitled, The Aspiring Leader's Guide to the Future. So with that in mind, today, Clay is gonna discuss three significant shifts in the leadership landscape, as well as tips on how to navigate those three challenges. Now, I want you to stick around toward the end because when Clay wraps up, I'm going to tell you how you can download a free resource for you and your team that goes along with Clay's content. And now, here's my friend Clay Scroggins. A couple of months ago, I'm sitting in the carpool line about to drop our kids off at school. I've got our 12-year-old and our 10-year-old in the back seat, and I'm looking at my phone because I had received an invitation. It was a going away party for some friends of ours who were moving to California. And my kid said, what are you looking at? I said, oh, I'm looking at an invitation to this party. They said, are you gonna go? I said, I think so. And just as I said that, I voice texted. I said, hey, excited about the party, count me in. From the back seat, all I heard was, oh, cringe, dad. No one says, count me in. Why did you even say that? I'm like, people definitely say, count me in. What are you talking about? They're like, no, they don't say that. That just makes you sound so old. It makes you sound like you're out of touch. I was like, okay, okay, okay. What should I say? And they responded. They said, you just say one word, bet. <laughs> I'm like, well, that is not the context for which I am familiar with that term. I said, what, what, what is bet? When you say, what does that mean? They said, it means for sure. It means I'm gonna show up. It means of course. I said, yeah, it means count me in. Same thing, right? Listen, life changes and life changes fast. Life has drastically changed just in the last few years. I mean, it's as if we've compressed 10 years of change into the last two years. And yes, of course, life changes, but so does leadership. Leadership has changed and is changing. And just so we're all on the same page, when I say leadership, I mean both what we want from our leaders, but also what we're trying to, what we're hoping to develop into. See, leadership is powerful. I believe every single person is a leader. It's this opportunity we have to persuade others and inspire others, to, to impact others. It's moving people to do what they might not want to do to achieve what it is that they want to achieve. And, and we do it, we experience it, we exercise it in every area of life, which is why it's so important and why it's so important that we pay attention to how it's changing. As Wayne Gretzky, the famous hockey player said, I don't skate to where the puck has been. I skate to where the puck is going. We have to anticipate where leadership is changing, how leadership is changing, and most importantly, how we can change as well. No matter what kind of leadership you, you learned, let, let's make sure to hold on to what still works. Let's, let's make sure to let go of what doesn't, and let's make sure to learn to develop into the kind of leader the future will demand of us. But in order to do that, we have to know, we have to know how it's changing. So today, just to get the conversation started, I, I've brought three ways that leadership is changing. Now, these are just my observations, three that I put into a book with six others, nine total, called The Aspiring Leader's Guide to the Future. We don't have time for me to give you all nine of them. Plus, if I give you all nine of them, how in the world would my kids eat if no one bought the book, right? And so I feel completely confident that these are true, but what I want more than anything is I want these to be helpful. I want these to be things that we can hang up on the wall and say, all right, if this is where it's going, how can we become this kind of leader? So hopefully these will turn into conversations that you might have at work. These might become conversations you might have with your team. You might even be able to ask the question for yourself, hey, how, how do you see leadership changing? But for today, let's get started with these three. The, the first one. You don't have to know it all to start leading. You don't have to know it all to start leading. A business professor at University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Dave Mayer, not akin to John, 
uh, defines implicit leadership theory as the subconscious thoughts and biases around the idea of what it means to be a leader. When I ask you, what does a leader look like? What, what makes up a leader? You have an instinctual response. And it usually includes words like confident and competent and knowledgeable. And that might have once been true, but that is changing. There was a day where you could learn enough about a subject or a field to feel like a leader. But if that was ever actually true, it's certainly not true any longer. Information is changing and developing and being created so rapidly. There's constant updates, improvements, and technological advancements that are just too difficult to even keep up with. My, my kids now learn this new form of math. We've discovered that Pluto's not actually a planet. And as it turns out, you can't actually see the Great Wall of China from the moon. <laughs> Mind blown, right? Yeah, people have always wanted leaders that, that will be honest, of course. But what do you do when you don't actually know the answer? Well, you certainly don't fake it, and you definitely don't make it up, because others will Google it before you even finish the sentence. No, you use these three words, I don't know. And yes, I know technically that's a four-word sentence, but for that lovely contraction. But these are words that leaders of the future have to have on ready. I don't know. Stephen Levitt recently said in an episode about this topic on the Freakonomics podcast, he said, what I found in business is that almost no one will ever admit to not knowing an answer to a question. So even if they absolutely have no idea what the answer is, if it's within their realm of expertise, faking it is just an important part of leadership. I really have come to believe that one of the most important things you can learn as an MBA is how to present yourself like you know the answer to any question, even though you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And I found it's really one of the most destructive forces in business, that everyone masquerades like they know the answer and no one will ever admit that they don't actually know. I think he's right. And leaders of the future, Leaders of the future are better when they do this. Leaders of the future know when they don't know, and they aren't afraid to admit that they don't know. In fact, let me tell you what happens when you do this. When you use the words, I don't know, you build trust as an authentically honest leader. You create a culture that values honesty over pretending, and you offer people an invitation to join in on figuring out the answer. That's one of the greatest gifts that you can give others as a leader is to invite others into your weaknesses. Hey, I'm working on something big and I can't do it alone. I need you. The words I don't know, that they go a long way in making you an honest, humble, and trustworthy leader, but it will also be a sign that you're developing into the kind of leader the future is demanding. So, so don't let your lack of knowledge keep you from leading. Have the words, I don't know, on ready. And now for the next one, number two, get the right people on the bus and a few who aren't so right. Written in 2001, Jim Collins released Good to Great, which has been heralded as one of the greatest leadership books ever written, and rightly so. I mean, it has sold over three million copies and it's praised for its data-driven look at what has allowed the, the most successful companies in the world to sustain long-term success. I mean, seriously, it is in the Hall of Fame of leadership books because it's 300 pages of hypotheses and research and analytics and advice it's one of the leadership books that I refer back to almost as a textbook whenever I feel stuck or uninspired as a leader. And the phrase Jim Collins um, is perhaps best known for is one that I've had ringing in the back of my head for years now. Every time the responsibility of managing a new team or managing new people comes my way, I try to do what Collins instructs. He says, get the right 
people on the bus. Yeah, as Colin says, he says it's first who and then what. We expected that good to great leaders would begin by setting a new vision, setting a new strategy, but we found instead that they first got the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus, the right people in the right seats, and then they figured out where to drive it. The old adage, people are your most important asset, it turns out to be wrong. People are not your most important asset. The right people are. Get the right people on the bus, Colin says. What a phrase. I mean, it's, it's simple, it's memorable, it's instructive. You don't even have to read the book to even understand it or to know what it means. You patiently hire great people, you relentlessly evaluate the ones you already have, and you astutely move each person into the right seat. You unapologetically fire the ones that don't fit. Easy enough, right? Wrong. See, something has changed and is changing about the future. And as one of my coworkers reminds me all the time, we rise and fall based on our definitions. We rise and fall based on how we define the words we use. And so I wanna start by taking a look at that phrase, the right people. What do we mean when we say the right people and not the wrong people on our teams? Too many leaders, myself included, have made the mistake of dismissing the wrong people. Yeah, I mean, I, I have found this thing in me, and, and I wonder if you would be honest enough with yourself, if you would find it in you as well, that there is an incredibly strong temptation for me to define right as same. And when I do this, I'm, I'm subtly and subconsciously loving myself and stroking my own ego. I mean, you ask 10 people who they think the right people for a team or a task are, and you'll probably get 10 different answers. Determining the right, determining the wrong people. It, it almost brings up memories of grade school, categorizing people into groups, keeping certain people in some groups and others out of other groups. And clearly, we're not talking about empty phrases like, you know, he comes from money or she's got a cool factor about her. They know the right people. No, see, on the flip side, the, the term wrong people, it conjures up these negative connotations. Words like he's challenging or she's toxic or complicated or pushy, ambitious, quirky. Those words come to mind. And depending on what your team is trying to accomplish, you may just need some people with those qualities. Now, surely in other cases, people like this will destroy a team, but too often individuals have been classified as the wrong person for the wrong reasons. They're, they're different or they're too driven or they're difficult to manage. But I see a few significant reasons why we need people who may seem like the wrong people or people that we might have once labeled as the wrong people. Wrong people, that they can be most helpful in making right decisions. The, the research proves this over and over again. I mean, according to the experts at people management, researchers found that when diverse teams of, of three or more people made a business decision, they outperformed individual decision makers more than 87% of the time. These diverse teams were also shown to make decisions faster than individuals could and they benefited from a 60% improvement upon decision-making. But we also see that people you might have once labeled as wrong people, they're just the ones that will make you the right leader. Over and over again, I've had experiences where the very people I once considered unfit for the bus I was driving, these men and women became the catalyst for my own personal growth. I mean, that's often true with the wrong people. They may be exactly what you need to help you change and grow as a leader. So be careful about writing them off too quickly. Next time you bump into one, take a quick look in the mirror first to see if there's something in you that needs to change. But we also see that people you might have once labeled wrong people, they're the ones that help you see the right way. Abraham Lincoln understood this. As, as Doris Kearns Goodwin points out in Team of Rivals, his cabinet was made up of people who were very different than him. Most of them had actually run against him and obviously lost to him in the presidential election. They saw the world differently than he did. 
but he didn't let that stop him from putting them around the table. And their impact is quite large. (laughs) How Lincoln rolled out the Emancipation Proclamation, when he rolled it out, what he said in it was all informed by others who saw the world a bit different than him, and clearly it made a difference. Frederick Douglass said this about Lincoln, though high in position, the humblest could approach him and feel at home in his presence. Though deep, he was transparent. Though strong, he was gentle. Though decided and pronounced in his convictions, he was tolerant toward those who differed from him and patient under reproaches. Just as they were needed in the past, those attributes, those are attributes that we all need to be leaders of the future. And though it of course, is not as catchy as Jim Collins' bus principle. This is the mantra that future leaders should live by. Don't dismiss too early, don't develop too late, and lead the ones you have until you just can't anymore. Uh, I think Jim and I agree that getting it right with the people on your team, of course, it's essential, and getting it wrong is far too costly. I mean, remember, these are people that were leading, people with lives and families and hearts and souls and futures. And so let's commit to treating the bus roster with as much care and thoughtfulness as possible. That is the way of aspiring future leaders. And now for the last way that leadership is changing. Number three, conflict never gets easy. It never goes away or feels great. As a society, we're not exactly becoming more resilient. I mean, truthfully, we're growing conflict avoidant and and with each passing day, even less skilled at dealing with the interpersonal challenges of everyday life. The relational discord of childhood, it's now following us into the workplace. And future leaders will require a well-developed set of conflict resolution skills. For one, our workforces are engaging in conversations that previous generations just avoided. This means you'll need to grow more comfortable talking about difficult topics that require a sense of vulnerability. Difficult conversations are defined as anything you find it hard to talk about. I mean, they're just not what they used to be. And this trend will only become more and more prevalent, which is why I wanna give you a a simple plan for approaching conflict. This plan is future-proof, it's battle-tested, and it's one size fits all. Now, of course, it's not gonna solve all your problems, but going into a tense situation with a plan is so much better than not having a plan. And as hopeful as you might be when you begin a difficult conversation, hope alone, is definitely not enough. Now, before you even begin, I would just encourage you, you got to put in a little preparation. I mean, it took me years to realize that preparing for a tough, high stakes conversation is a game changer. It's not a magic bullet, but it often is the difference between resolution and regret. I mean, if you'll start with some alone time and force yourself to get to the root issue to develop some questions of curiosity, and to plan your ideal next steps, you're gonna feel so much better about this conversation. Now, now this, this plan includes four simple steps alliterated to stick in your long-term memory system. Number one, affirm. Number two, ask. Number three, acknowledge. And number four, advise and make sure that you stay until the end where you're going to find this John Grisham worthy plot twist. How about that for a teaser? Step one, affirm. The first step is it's crucial because with any high stakes emotional conversation, there, there, needs, to, there needs to be this sense of safety in the conversation. And you establish boundaries so the person doesn't feel threatened. You start a difficult conversation by affirming whatever it is that you can say about the other person. Angela, I I want to have this conversation with you because I care about you, because I have a lot of respect for you. I, I really enjoy working with you. Obviously, you don't need to say anything that's untrue, but you do need to force yourself to say something meaningful. 
again, this is where preparation comes in handy. If you give yourself the freedom to develop these thoughts in advance, you'll end up in a better spot. If you wait until you're in the heat of the moment, that is tightrope level danger. You may or may not come up with the right words. And so give yourself the safety net of preparation and make sure you say exactly what it is that you want to say. And then you start there. You just affirm the very thing you're afraid of. For example, you could say, you know what, as I thought about this conversation, I, I don't want you to think I'm leaving because I'm not. As difficult as the conversation may be, you, you have to make sure that the person knows you're wanting to and willing to have this conversation because you care about him. You care about her as a person. You don't need to make it a compliment sandwich, but you do need to make a meaningful declaration of your best intentions for that person and for your future with them. Step two, ask. See, too many people go into difficult conversations thinking they fully understand the situation or they have the other person solved like a Sudoku puzzle. Missing this step, missing this step will come back to bite you if you're not methodical and humble and genuinely curious. You have to force yourself to sit down with a blank notepad and write out all the questions that you could ask about the situation. This will help you establish this posture of humility and it will even create a positive atmosphere for even the most difficult conversations. Yeah, asking questions, it benefits all parties involved. It forces you to admit that there's much that you don't know, but it also immediately communicates care and concern and compassion for the other person. It gives the person the, the floor to talk and it gives you the opportunity to listen. There's a really good reason that the authors of the New Testament recorded Jesus himself asking over 300 questions. You don't have to be a math major to understand the simple logic of my own grandmother's advice. Now listen, son, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? So step two, you ask. Step three, acknowledge. Every conversation, whether at work or at home, it has the potential for misunderstanding because of that, we have to learn to state back what the other person has said without agreeing or disagreeing with it, without defending yourself, without even bringing solutions. But after you affirm what you can affirm, after you ask as many questions as you need to ask to better understand the situation, it's now time to state back what you have heard. You even can use very similar words, or you can give your own version of what you heard. But this is the third step for your plan in conflict resolution. And as simple and basic as this seems, it's an immediate feedback loop for you to clarify how much you understand about the situation and how the other person sees it. If you're wrong, the other person will tell you you're wrong, but you, you just don't know until you've acknowledged what you've heard. So for example, you might say, okay, so after I've asked you these questions, what I hear you saying is that your biggest fear is what this change is going to cost us financially. And then you give the other person a chance to say, you know what? No, that's not actually my biggest fear. Let me think about that a little bit. And it leads to an even better, more rich conversation. And now you're ready for step four, advise. After the first three steps, then and only then are you ready to advise or, or give the critical feedback that you wanna offer. Resist, however, resist being critical. I mean, the temptation is to point out everything that's wrong with the other person or with the relationship or with the organization, but don't take the bait on that. No, pointing out problems is just a pointless power trip. Naturally, it makes you feel powerful, but without solutions that follow, your criticism doesn't really move anything forward and it rarely makes a difference. Instead, seek to offer solutions that can bring change that can make something better, or that can improve the quality of the relationship. And refuse, I mean refuse to let the issue define the relationship between the two of you. Imagine the two of you sitting side by side, working on the problem together. And even if the other person tries to put the conflict between you, don't allow that to happen. Put the problem on the table and get on the same side of the proverbial booth. Real progress is made when you can work on the problem together. If you can stay in that posture, 
then the advice that you give, it won't actually feel like advice. And now here's the plot twist. If you don't go through the process this way, you'll end up going through it backwards. I, I'm serious. If you rip off an angry text to your boss with all your advice before having affirmed, asked, or acknowledged, if, if you give all the reasons why you're frustrated, then what you're gonna end up doing is you're gonna have to end up going through it the other way. You're gonna have to end up it, acknowledging that you were wrong, asking for forgiveness, and affirming that you still want your job. I remember my high school baseball coach used to use that phrase, practice makes perfect. But in this case, I don't know that it actually does. I mean, practice is good, but you're never going to get conflict perfectly right. Something's always gonna go wrong. You'll use the wrong tone. You'll make a distracting statement that will derail the conversation. You'll be too rushed in the process or at times move too slowly to have the conversation. But the longer I've led, the more I've realized I'm never going to be perfect at conflict. It's inevitable that I will somehow get it wrong, but don't let that stop you from having it. Lean into the conflict for the sake of the other person, for the sake of your own growth, and if nothing else, for the sake of the future leader the world needs you to be. This is one skill that I can guarantee you, you will not regret developing. And as with many aspects of leadership, you'll never get it all the way right, even, even still, the fight is so worth it. And your ability to navigate the conflict will get better and better with each conversation you have. So those are just three ways that leadership is changing. There are more, but over the past decade, I've been observing and prognosticating leadership changes and trends, searching for a wall that I can hang up my own opinions about leadership and what it will look like in the future. Why? Well, because it matters. This matters so deeply. Who you are as a leader matters. But who you're becoming as a leader matters even more. Yes, of course leadership is changing. It's changing drastically. But for you to become the kind of leader the future will demand, you have to see the changes. You have to believe them. And then you have to change yourself. And, and my hope is that, that maybe this could paint a, a Bob Ross-esque picture of what leadership will look like in the future. And it might just give us something to aim for, something to work towards, something to develop into. And I hope that this will give you a moment, a moment of pause, a moment of deliberation, and a moment of motivation to become the kind of leader the future is demanding. For the sake of your future, and for the sake of future generations. Well, of course, Clay is right. Leadership is constantly changing and it will continue to change. Leaders who adjust their sales will benefit from those changes. Those who don't will eventually, well, they will eventually fall behind. So to ensure you are the former and not the latter, we've created a free resource for you and your team that goes along with today's content. Just visit the link at the bottom of your screen to get that for you and your team. As always, thanks so much for joining us. If you liked this content, please make sure you share it with a friend and we will see you next time for another helpful edition of Leadership Labs.